pháp Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir, you're audible. Can I start? Start, sir. Yeah. Wait a minute, sir. Sir. Yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, start, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Nilanjan Umesh. I'm a critical care consultant at Rajagiri Hospital, Kochi. And uh, Today, I'm going to speak about uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. I'll be concentrating on the diagnosis and uh, prevention. So uh, this is going to be an uh, interactive session. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, I'll be first introducing you into the uh, topic, and then we have a couple of uh, case-based questions, and we'll have a couple of MCQs also at the end. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, do put it in the chat box. I'll address it at the end. And uh, if you are having any, uh, if you when you are answering to the questions that I ask, please again put it in the chat box. Okay, we'll have a good interactive session. So hospital acquired pneumonia is the most common nosocomial infection, and it uh, affects almost uh, one in hundred patients overall, and up to one in ten patients on invasive mechanical ventilation. Although the mortality rate attrib attributable to VAP varies with patient characteristics, recent data reports an estimated mortality of approximately 10%. 50% of VAP begins in the first week of mechanical ventilation. So there is no doubt that VAP prolongs the duration of mechanical ventilation and increases the length of ICU and hospital stay. And hence, it should be addressed. So there's something called as VAP rate. It's uh, important because it's a quality indicator of any ICU. The incidence increases with the increase in duration of ventilation. So it is defined as the total number of VAP cases in a time period follow, uh, divided by the total number of ventilator days in the same time period in 2000. So Indian data reports a VAP rate of around 22 to 37 for 1000 ventilator days. The incidence varies widely from 18 to 57 percentage in uh, different ICUs across India. And the etiology uh, is mainly gram-negative bacilli, uh, which is about 85 to 95%, mainly Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, and Klebsiella. And GPC is around for 10 to 15%. Uh, the situation is reversed in the West, actually, where uh, we have more cases of uh, GPC web, uh, particularly MRC. So this was a study which had been done in uh, CMC Ludhiana, uh, where they uh, cultured the organism, uh, which commonly grew uh, in the ET or the bowel secretions, and uh, found that the predominant organism in their ICU was Acinetobacter, uh, followed by Pseudomonas. And another interesting observation that they made was uh, the percentage of VAP uh, in different age groups. They found that VAP was more common uh, in the age group of 0 to 15, and 46 to 60. So what are the risk factors for developing VAP? The major risk factor is, of course, mechanical ventilation. Then we have factors that enhance the colonization of the oropharynx and the stomach, particularly the administration of antibiotics, admission to ICU, underlying chronic lung diseases. Then conditions favoring the aspiration into the respiratory tract or reflux from GI tract, like supine position, nasogastric tube placement, GERD, coma, delirium, intubation and extubation, immobilization, <laughs> surgery of the head and neck, thorax and abdomen. Then we have conditions that require prolonged use of mechanical ventilatory support with potential exposure to contaminated respiratory devices and contact with contaminated hands. And finally, the host factors, extremes of age, as I uh, showed you, malnutrition, immunocompromised individuals, and uh, underlying conditions or the disease process. So uh, previously, there was an etiological classification for uh, VAP. We had early VAP, which is less than four days, and uh, late VAP, which developed for more after four days. Uh, the significance of this was there was a difference in the spectrum of organisms which caused VAP. In early VAP, we had streptococcus pneumonia, H influenza, methicillin sensitive Staph aureus, 
and uh, GNBs like E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Proteus, and Seracea. While in late web, we had a spectrum of Pseudomonas, ESBL, Acinetobacter, usually the resistant Acinetobacter, MRSA, and Legionella. However, now, uh, because uh, of uh, the recent cultures, uh, there has been shown that there has been no difference between the organisms which cause early web or late web. So we don't particularly stress on this classification. So what are the risk factors for multidrug resistant pathogens? The risk factors mainly, there are prior IV antibiotic use within 90 days, septic shock at the time of web, ARDS preceding web, five or more days of hospitalizations prior to the occurrence of web, and acute renal replacement therapy prior to web. And almost for every other condition like MDR, HAP, MRSA, WAP, HAP, and uh, other MDR pseudomonas, we have prior history of antibiotic use within 90 days as an important risk fracture. So coming to the pathogenesis, how come, how does a patient develop WAP? So the primary route is the leakage of secretions around the endotracheal tube. That even though whatever said and done, even in spite of having a tight, tight cuff and a proper size tube, still micro aspirations can occur uh, through the endotracheal tube, uh, to the sides of the endotracheal tube, which can cause aspiration pneumonia. Then it can be due to impair, impairment of mucociliary clearance and gravity dependence of mucus flow in airways. It can be due to biofilm development, low patient immunity, virulent pathogens, and certain uncommon mechanisms like inhalation, hematogenous spread, and gut translocation. So this is a very important diagram, particularly from a nursing point of view. The primary cause of ventilator-associated pneumonia is aspiration. It can be due to increased secretions. It can be due to uh, the ventilator condensate. It can be due to aerosols. It can be due to low trachea, endotracheal intracuff pressure. So please check the cuff pressure regularly, endotracheal intubations frequently, on and off, accidental extubation. Again, that's a very big risk factor. So please prevent as accidental extubation in your ICUs. Contaminated waters and medication solution, contaminated equipments, gastric over distension. Again, a patient who has feeding intolerance has a very high risk of aspirating uh, his uh, bowel contents. Nursing a patient in supine position, uh, that is why uh, we always stress on head and elevation. And finally, inadequate staffing, nursing or the respiratory therapy. Like if we have a nurse who is managing three or more patients in the ICU at a time, it's certainly going to increase the chances of developing a van. So now I come to my first uh, clinical case scenario. Uh, we have a 34-year-old male who got intubated following an RTA for poor GCS. Uh, his CT brain was done, which showed a frontoparietal SDH and an SH. And the patient was taken up for decompressive craniectomy and post-op was continued on mechanical ventilation, IV antibiotics and other supportive measures. His GCS gradually improved and he was given a pressure support trial on day 5, but he failed. And on day 8, he started developing fevers and thick yellow secretions. An FIO2 requirement increased from 0.3 to 0.7 with a peep from 5 cm to 8 cm. His chest x-ray showed a new left middle zone patch. So my question is, uh, what next? What can we do? Uh, what do you do next for this patient? Any answers? Can anyone tell what we do next? Please, please uh, type in the chat box. What, what do you think the patient is having and what do we do? Dr. Manjunath, anyone answering? Or... No, there's no, no one. answer from anyone in the like, chat. Okay. Okay, so I'll continue. So uh, here we have many options. So yeah, somebody has raised hand. Yes, I think. Yeah, can you uh, unmute yourself and uh, let us know? Ramba, Ramba, I think. Yeah. I've given the yeah. permission to talk, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Ramba, Ramba, please, please uh, tell hello, us. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, I can. Yes. We can, we can hear yeah. you. Sir, yeah. in, in this case scenario, I feel head of the bed has to be elevated. Uh, okay. Depending upon the doctor's advice, of course, basically we are instructed to rise from twenty-five degrees to thirty-five degrees. Okay. And patient requires uh, frequent aseptic suctioning. Okay. Very good. And mouth care, uh, like we have to give three times in a day with the chlorhexidine solution. But if okay. the patient is getting more secretions, we can provide whenever required. That could be four times or even six times also. Okay. So I feel uh, these yeah. are the measures to prevent, uh, to control and prevent VAP in this scenario. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So yeah, uh, may you have uh, raised many good points here. Uh, the only thing is, uh, he has already developed a VAP. So probably he has developed a VAP. So our uh, main aim in this situation scenario would be to uh, how to diagnose which organism or uh, how to uh, understand what antibiotics we need to give. So that uh, brings us to diagnosing VAP. So diagnosing VAP, uh, it is imprecise. There are many uh, criteria for diagnosing VAP, which is based on a combination of uh, clinical factors, microbiological yeah. factors, and chest x-ray. So earlier we had the Johansson criteria for developing VAP. Uh, that is after two days on mechanical ventilation, if there is the presence of a new or progressive radiographic infiltrate, plus at least two of the three clinical features, that is fever more than 38 degrees Celsius, leukocytosis or leukopenia, and purulent secretions, any two of these three. And it represents the most accurate combination of criteria for starting empirical antibiotic therapy. Even in uh, post-mortem, uh, when it was found, uh, patients had, uh, a develop, had developed VAP in 30 to 40 percentage of patients. But the problem in uh, this case is it shows that it's not clinical criteria is not alone enough. We need a radiological evidence also to diagnose VAP. So next comes the CDC criteria. So the CDC criteria, it also considered three aspects. First is radiology, where there are two or more serial chest x-rays with at least one of the following. New or progressive infiltrates, consolidation or cavitation, signs and symptoms. That is at least one of the following, fever, leukopenia or leukocytosis, an altered me uh, mental status, that is if the age is more than 70 years, and at least two of the following, new purulent sputum or change in sputum characteristics or amount, new or worsening cough, dyspnea or tachypnea, rails on auscultation or worsening gas exchange. And then we have the microbiology criteria, that is again at least one of the following, Positive quantitative culture from minimally contaminated lower respiratory tract specimen. Positive culture of pleural fluid. Positive culture of lung tissue histological examination. Or a positive growth in blood culture not related to another source of inf infection. So uh, please note here they have told that the specimen obtained via an endotracheal suctioning is not a minimally contaminated specimen. And hence what they suggest is a bronchoscopy, a distal respiratory tract sampling which can be done through a bronchoscopy. Then we have the CPIS criteria. The CPIS criteria, it has six points, tracheal secretions, the leukocyte count, temperature, the PF ratio, PAO2 by FIO2 ratio, chest X-ray, and the culture of the tracheal aspirate. So based on these six uh, points, they are given uh, points one, two, three, and the maximum score is 12. If a patient is having a CPI score more than 6, it suggests VAP. However, the problem with this CPI scoring is that it has a sensitivity of only 77% and a specificity of only 42%. So now we come to the 2013 NSSN definition, which is being uh, followed and accepted in uh, most places. It has been given to overcome the subjectivity and variability of VAP diagnosis based on objective and recordable data. So it classifies events as ventilator associated events in the form of an algorithm and includes three tires. One is VAC, IVAC and PVAC. So it includes all the conditions and complications which occur due to mechanical ventilation and not VAP alone. So the main difference from other 
criteria. It detects all ventilator associated complications and not only VAP. Uh, it omits chest X ray as a criteria, which we saw was a criteria in the Johansson and uh, the CDC as well as the CPI scoring. And all ventilator associated events need not be treated. Okay, so that's also important. So first we come to ventilator associated condition. So after two days of stability or improvement on the ventilator, the patient has at least one of the following indicators of worsening oxygenation. Increase in daily minimum FiO2 of more than 0.2 for more than or equal to 0.2 uh, for more than or equal to two days. And an increase in daily minimum PEEP value of more than or equal to three centimeters for more than or equal to two days. Now, in addition to this, if a patient has a temperature more than 38 degrees Celsius or less than 36 degrees Celsius or a WBC count more than 12,000 or less than 4,000 and a new antimicrobial agent has to be started and is continued for more than four days, then we call it IVAC, infection-related ventilator-associated complication. And if this criteria is also fulfilled, and the patient has purulent secretions and or a positive culture. We classify it either as possible or probable VAP. So possible VAP is when a gram stain evidence of purulent secretions are there or a positive pathogenic pulmonary culture. And probable VAP is when we have a gram stain evidence of purulent pulmonary secretions as well as a quantitative or a semi-quantitative growth of pathogenic organisms beyond specific threshold. So how do we investigate? Uh, that was how we had to proceed probably in that case. We have to do a respiratory sampling. So there are non-bronchoscopic as well as bronchoscopic methods. The non-bronchoscopic methods are tracheal aspirates and a minibal. And the bronchoscopic methods are bronchiolola lavage and a protected specimen of brush. So when we often get a report, the initial uh, report, we get a microscopic report. Uh, how do we interpret? So initially, uh, we need to see the squamous epithelial cells. If there are more than 10 squamous epithelial cells uh, per in a, a single micro in a single field, that means the specimen is contaminated. So that specimen is not going to be useful. Probably it contains oral flora or uh, uh, something from the tube. So uh, that's not a good specimen. Now, if a specimen has alveolar macrophages, uh, that indicates that the specimen is from the lower respiratory tract. And so probably it's a good specimen and so we, we can go ahead and culture the specimen and treat accordingly. If the specimen, initial specimen has a neutrophilic count of more than 25, then that means it shows there is evidence of infectivity. And finally, uh, we get an initial bacterial morphology. It can be GNB or GPC, uh, gram-positive cocaine pairs or GNCB. Uh, it all helps in uh, us in changing antibiotics and in deciding for the management. Now, there are certain quantitative culture thresholds. Like we cannot say that a sample uh, having, say, 100 uh, bacilli or 100 colony forming units is good enough uh, and we treat according to that. So there are fixed uh, culture thresholds. So if it is an endotracheal aspirate, it should be the colony forming unit should be more than 10 raised to 5 per ml. For a bronchial alveolar lavage, it should be more than 10 raised to 4 colony forming units per ml. And for a protected specimen of brush, it should be more than 10 raised to 3 colony forming units per ml. And there are certain exclusion points from the culture. Okay. So if you have a normal respiratory flora, if you have candid, candida species of yeast, which is not otherwise specified, if you have coagulase negative staph, staphylococcus species, and enterococcus. So these organisms are usually not, uh, usually do not cause VAP. And so we should. Uh, be careful when we treat or uh, when we start antibiotics according to these organisms. So utility of sampling methods, as I have told you, the bronchoscopic method is the most specific. It helps to avoid contamination. It helps to avoid uh, all contamination from other uh, sources and helps to de-escalate antibiotics. Tracheal aspirates still continue to be used in evaluation of VAP, especially in low resource set, uh, settings. And if tracheal aspirates are used, we need to screen it with a gram stain so as to discard the contaminated sample. Especially, we can see the squamous epithelial cells. If there is a large number of squamous epithelial cells, uh, the sample is contaminated, may not be useful. 
So that brings us to the second case scenario. This is a 42 year old male. It is a case of OP poisoning and was intubated in the ER in view of increased secretions in bradycardia and shifted to the ICU. And he was started on atropin infusion but developed atropin psychosis on uh, day two and was commenced on fentanyl infusion. The atropin dose was reduced but the patient continued to have copious secretions. So the question is, as a bedside nurse, what all precautions would you take to prevent VAP and what all would you suggest to the attending doctor? So as I always tell uh, everyone in my ICU, the uh, nursing staff or the nurse at the bedside is uh, one of the most important persons taking care of the patient. And uh, they are the ones who always tell us what is the amount of secretions and what is the color of secretions, how frequently suctioning has to be done. So uh, they are the first ones actually to notice a VAP. Anyone, anyone, please raise your hands. Please put your answers in the chat box. Anyone is there, Dr. Manjanath? Anyone raising their hands? Yeah, I, no, there's no one raised hand, I think. See, he's asking what all the precautions would you take to like, prevent the VAP? I think he has already mentioned in all his slides now. Anyone wants to answer? No. Okay. Okay, we'll continue. So, uh, yeah. so that brings me to preventive strategies for VAP. So this is a recent update which has been uh, promoted by the IDSA and the SHIA and the APIC. Uh, strategies to prevent VAP, ventilator-associated events. So they have divided it into essential practices, additional practices, and they have certain recommendations which should not be followed. So first coming to essential practices, use HFNC or NIV as appropriate and whenever safe and feasible. Second one is preferentially use multimodal strategies and medications other than benzodiazepines to manage agitation. So uh, usually uh, we use different, like uh, some places we are using uh, fentanyl infusions uh, or uh, sedation and some places we are now switched to uh, dexmedetomidin and uh, they have not specified a particular uh, opioid or a, a particular agent, but they are told to avoid benzodiazepines to manage agitation. Next one, provide early enteral rather than parental nutrition. And uh, the last point, change the ventilatory circuit only if visibly soiled or malfunctioned. This is very important. Like I have seen in many, uh, some ICUs that they change the ventilator circuit uh, routinely uh, every two days or every three days. And uh, actually, this shows high quality of evidence. And uh, perhaps we need to change our practice according to it. Implement a ventilatory liberation protocol. This is also very important. Please assess readiness to extubate daily in patients who do not have a cont uh, contraindication. Uh, conducting spontaneous breathing trials is very important. And uh, as bedside nurses, uh, it is also your uh, duty. You can inform the attending doctor uh, that uh, the patient has become relatively conscious. Uh, there has been fewer episodes of dyspnea or desaturation. So ca can't we give a spontaneous breathing trial? Okay, so ventilation liberation protocols, they are associated with extubating patients an average of one day earlier compared to managing patients without a protocol. And again, minimize sedation, mobilize patients, and liberate them from the mechanical ventilators. This can be done synergistically. Provide daily oral care with toothbrushing, but without chlorhexidin. Again, another something uh, that is practice changing, uh, like before oral chlorhexidin was routinely used uh, for uh, mouth care, but uh, nowadays uh, we have been, uh, they are recommending toothbrushing. Provide early exercise and mobilization. Elevate the head end of the bed as uh, when previously someone had said 30 to 45 degrees. Now we come to additional approaches. Consider using selective decontamination of the oropharynx and digestive tract to decrease the microbial burden in ICUs with low prevalence of antibiotic resistant organisms. However, antibiotic decontamination 
is not recommended in countries, regions, or ICUs with high prevalence of antibiotic resistant organisms. Uh, most of our ICUs, unfortunately, are uh, having high prevalence of antibiotic resistant organisms. So perhaps we shouldn't be doing uh, selective decontamination of oropharynx and SDD. Next is consider using endotracheal tubes with subglottic secretion drainage ports to minimize the pooling of secretions above the endotracheal cuff in patients likely to require more than 40 to 72 hours of intubation. Again, practice changing, I guess. Uh, many of the ICUs, we are not using subglottic uh, tubes with subglottic drainage. Please, uh, I strongly recommend that we change to subglottic tubes. Consider post-pyloric feeding tube placement in patients with gastric intolerance who are at high risk of aspiration. So again, they are recommending in uh, patients who are having feeding intolerance, large amount of RT aspirates can go for uh, an NJ tube rather than an NG tube. Early tracheostomy. There has been a long-standing debate whether we need to do an early or a late tracheostomy. There have been many trials, TRACMAN PAC trials, which have been there. Uh, and uh, this is a recent meta-analysis of uh, 17 randomized trials, which suggest that early tracheostomy within seven days of intubation may be associated with a 40% decrease in vap rates, less time on mechanical ventilation, and fewer ICU days, but no difference in mortality. So... Please, uh, in case your patient is going to require long-term ventilation, uh, there's no signs, especially in neurological patients, no signs of neurological recovery. Early tracheostomy is a good option. Now, approaches that should not be considered as routine care of ventilator-associated pneumonia or events. I told you practice changing oral care with chlorhexidine. That is based on uh, a trial called as a oral trial. It showed the effect of oral chlorhexidine deadaptation and implementation of an oral care bundle on mortality for mechanically ventilated patients in the intensive care unit. And it showed that there was no benefit. No benefit was observed on ICU mortality, IVAPs, oral procedural pain, or time to extubation. Probiotics should not be used in patients with compromised immune systems or gastrointestinal disease that increase the risk of gut translocation. Now, there has been a lot of discussion about tapered endotracheal tube cups, silver-coated endotracheal tubes. Uh, they were advocated in the middle and many of these tubes were being used. And uh, But unfortunately, these guidelines, uh, they do not advocate them. They should not be considered as routine care. They do not help, uh, help in decreasing VAP or ventilatory associated events. Again, chlorhexidine bathing. Uh, so studies have suggested that chlorhexidine bathing can reduce the risk of VAP, but these findings have not been borne out in randomized trials. So the benefic benefic uh, benefic benefit might be in other healthcare associated infections like uh, CRBSI, but certainly not in VAP. And then again, approaches that definitely are not recommended for VAP. Again, this is something practice changing. Stress also prophylaxis. Uh, long we have since long it was included in the web bundle. Stress also uh, prophylaxis, uh, but uh, there has been trials, and uh, what they suggest is that there is no impact on uh, nosocomial or ventilator associated pneumonia, length of stay or mortality. We can perhaps use them in other cases, perhaps to lower the risk of GI bleeding in patients with se severe septic shock who might have micro ulcerations, yeah. But uh, as per se for VAP, there is no recommendation. Approaches that definitely are not recommended. Again, we have monitoring residual gastric volumes. Uh, monitoring patients for regurgitation and vomiting alone is as effective as monitoring patients for regurgitation, vomiting, and residual gastric vo uh, volumes with regard to VAP rates, duration of mechanical ventilation, and mortality. So, uh, some ICUs, they have a practice of uh, aspirating before uh, giving each feed. They give uh, feed intermittent feeding and uh, they aspirate before each feed. Uh, that is not recommended because even if you have a regurgitation or the patient has a vomiting, uh, that is as good as monitoring for this. Also, uh, measuring gastric residual volumes uh, via ultrasound, uh, that's also not necessary according to this guideline. Early parenteral nutrition is associated with increased mortality and nosocomial infections compared to late parenteral nutrition. So always, if there is an option of enteral feeding, please give enteral feeding. Never keep the patient on NPO unnecessarily. 
uh, give enteral give early enteral feeding uh, via the ng or an nj if there is feeding intolerance and preferably start parental nutrition your tpn your ppn start it late preferably after 7 days of icu or uh, ventilator so now we come to the wap bundle it's often asked in your exams uh, there are many versions of the wap bundle and uh, lately they have been calling it the ventilator associated bundle uh, this is the bundle which is uh, advocated by the west yorkshire critical care and the major trauma uh, society which consists of eight elements most of these have already been uh, discussed in the previous uh, guideline so uh, first one is subglottic suction endotracheal or the tracheostomy tubes should be used in patients uh, who it is anticipated will be mechanically ventilated for more than 72 hours next uh, mechanical ventilation ventilated patient should be tracheally intubated with an orotracheal tube and cuff pressure maintained between 20 to 30 cm of water optimally 25 cm of water this is very important again uh, the next point is also the cuff pressure measurement should be carried out every 4 to 6 hours as a minimum and uh, following any significant movement of the patient transfer or mobilization so please <laughs> when uh, we shift the patient probably for a ct or an mri or from one bed to another or for dialysis or something please ensure that the cuff is inflated the cuff pressure is between 20 to 30 preferably 25 you can use uh, use the manometer and check the cuff pressure regularly daily sedation hold unless contraindicated or based on your targeted ras score patient should be nursed in a semi recumbent position uh, 30 to 45 degree unless contraindicated like certain uh, neuro patient neurotrauma patients ventilator tubings and suction systems should only be changed if specifically indicated such as visible soiling to avoid unnecessary changes stress ulcer prophylaxis again they have mentioned should be used judiciously and only in patients considered to be at high risk of upper gi bleeding if a patient is prescribed stress ulcer prophylaxis this should be reviewed regularly and specifically when enteral feeding is established so if a patient actually does not have uh, any uh, risk factors for upper gi bleeding then enteral feeding is actually good enough uh, there is no need of additionally adding your pantoprazol or your rabiprazol or uh, something uh, your sucralfate or anything like that uh, that is what uh, they recommend and regular oral hygiene should be maintained oral care should be assessed and delivered according to the identify risk again the newer recommendation is tooth brushing not using oral chloroethylene so this is the uh, endotracheal tube with subglottic suction uh, this and uh, it's a very useful one uh, a systematic review and a meta analysis of 13 randomized control trials it evaluated subglottic secretion drainage in 2442 patients and showed that there was a 45% wap reduction it shortened the patient and the length of stay in icu by 1.5 days and shortened the length of mechanical ventilation by 1.1 days so if you are not using it in your icus please advocate please uh, try to bring this in your system and uh, the other uh, one is uh, the photo is of uh, a cuff manometer to measure the cuff pressures this is how we measure the cuff pressure they have shown uh, please ensure that your cuff pressure is at least uh, 20 to 25 preferably 25 cm of water and during every shift Uh, i advise uh, the nurses who are when they change uh, your shift please start your shift by measuring the cuff pressure of your ventilated patient this is uh, the ideal position of your head and your, your patient should be like this most of the time uh, except uh, probably when you are giving a bath or uh, when you are turning the patients and uh, in case of neurotrauma patients probably uh, you will have to keep the patient head down uh, for more time and this is the ventilator circuit uh, that we use uh, with an hme filter <laughs> so so uh, with that we can come to the questions i'll uh, we have some mcqs and uh, so i really want all of you to try to answer this question yeah Let, please think, let me know yeah yes, i sir. think and we and we'll ask them to answer this so we we'll yes, yes, so definitely. we still have time yeah 
so uh, first question is uh, which of this would you not recommend for prevention of wap or ventilator associated event for uh, early enteral feeding protocols to minimize sedation daily oral chlorhexidine mouthwash changing the ventilator circuit only if it is visibly soiled or malfunctioning please please answer uh, in the chat box we have to just put a b c or d please answer anyone anyone has been answering please answer you can just take a guess if you are not sure of the answer it's not a big thing it's not a big thing to be wrong also anyone first question so there are nearly i think around 15 to 16 students hmm. yeah anyone please can be proactive to answer yeah the trauma anesthesia has okay raised their hand yes yeah i, I think it's simple i have discussed it in the yes yeah see delhi oral surgery yes okay. good excellent others anyone else anyone okay, has any other question. answer yeah anybody has anybody any other answer you can just put it in the chat box you can all put your answers in the chat box i think you can just put a b c or d don't even need to uh, raise your hands hands zio me somebody else has raised their hand i guess zio me yeah hello okay i'll go to the next one next question which of the following is not associated with an increased risk of wap or ventilator associated event accidental extubation head and elevation 30 to 45 degree supine position low endotracheal cuff pressures not associated again a simple question not associated yeah not associated we have been discussing all along in our uh, slides and the session you can type the answer yeah. here a b yeah. c d nobody is going to know also whether you are and it doesn't matter also whether you are right or wrong you can just type your answers okay i'll uh, go to the answers so 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 somebody said here uh, daily oral chlorhexidine mouthwash for the first question and second question head and elevation 30 to 45 degrees so next set of questions all the following are risk factors for mdr pathogens except iv antibiotic usage one month prior to development of wap renal replacement therapy prior to wap septic shock at the time of wap history of intracranial bleed prior to wap anyone please put your answers in the chat box bonus putting other question is which of the following organisms is not considered a cause of wap mdr klebsiella acinetobacter bomani candida auris or mrsa okay i think i'll uh, show the answers the so uh, mdr pathogens except history of intracranial bleed prior to wap the all the others they are associated with a high risk of having mdr pathogens and uh, but intracranial bleed there is no reason uh, that the patient should be a high risk for uh, developing wap others we have already uh, probably given antibiotics and are immunocompromised okay and uh, regarding the organisms uh, all these organisms they are notorious to cause uh, wap mdr klebsiella acinetobacter mrsa uh, much more common in the west candida auris uh, if we get candida auris in your et secretion or your bulb so uh, probably we should search for other systemic causes uh, your blood cultures or an another source of infection we, we may not be it was very very rare uh, we'll get an isolated 
swap due to Canada. Last set of questions. Which of the following is not part of CPIS code? Anyone? Temperature, leukocyte count, systolic BP, chest X-ray. Just type the answer A, B, C, D. Yeah, you just need to type. Anyway, it's an anonymous, I guess. So it's you just type A, B, C, D and uh, you can take a guess. All the following are risk factors for developing VAP except early mobilization and exercise, underlying chronic disease, uh, chronic lung disease, delirious patients. Prolonged ICU stay. Anyone? Okay, I think no one is answering. So, uh, C is the answer, which are not part of CPI score, systolic BP, and uh, early mobilization and exercises. So please uh, mobilize your patients, let them do good, give them good chest physio, good uh, limb physiotherapy, and uh, let them sit in the chair. Let them, this is very important for nursing uh, uh, nurses. Please uh, make your patients more active. Let them sit in the chair. Let them uh, give them uh, some book to read. Let them be active. Okay. So, yeah, with this, uh, yeah, anyone? Yeah, only table should have fallen in the Sorry? Okay, that's all for today. Uh, so, that's the end actually of the class. And, uh, if you have any doubts, anybody has any doubts or any questions, uh, Dr. Manjunath, uh, please, you would like to add something, please do add. Uh, yeah, so see, for all the students, I think so nearly around 15 of them are there. See, this step session is like meant like for you to learn about intensive care. So be proactive and uh, please make a notes of all this and the MCQs, like what we are actually doing it here, these are the MCQs actually come in the exam. It's almost the same type of MCQs. It will come in the exam like for you guys. So I would recommend for all of you to please be active and be attentive and please attend all the, the sessions. Yes. I fully agree with Dr. Manjunath. Please uh, be more active, especially during the uh, questions. Please do answer the, make it a habit to answer all the MCQs so that uh, you can take a guess. Maybe you can, uh, uh, from four options, uh, you might be confused between two and uh, then you can take a guess. But uh, that's going to certainly help you during your exams. If you do mistakes here, it is fine. You should not do yeah. the same mistakes in the exam. Yeah. Any okay, doubts, think, anything? Uh, any doubts? Somebody has put something in the chat. No, no. They have just written okay. Okay, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay, if there are no more doubts, uh, should we call it up, Dr. Manjana? Do you want to? Yes, yes, I think. Say, yeah. say something. Uh, so I think it's all been add? done. Yeah. Oh, I think like, uh, so. So your slides actually covered like most of the things, and it is updated with all the recent uh, guidelines as well. So if at all if they learn this in for their exams and for their uh, clinical practice, I think it should be like more than enough like, for them. And he has updated each and everything. Every bundle, the parameter, he has shown the evidence and he has given the guidelines in detail. So I think it's like more than enough. Okay. So we'll wind up, I think. So yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manjunath, a lot. Thank, thank you. Thank you, for Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.